Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to follow on from the anatomy now and let's uh, just recap and then put the anatomy in terms of the echo. So uh, looking from above, uh, the aortic valve is anterior to the mitral valve. And the two key landmarks that you always want to keep in your mind with all these imaging is the atrial septum and the left atrial appendage because that'll tell you where you are uh, when you're looking at uh, the leaflets of the aortic valve. So the aortic valve, three leaflets as you heard. The non-coronary cusp uh, is always near, is near the atrial septum. So if you can see an aortic valve near an atrial septum, it's a non-coronary cusp. The right coronary cusp is the most anterior and the left coronary cusp is next to left atrial appendage. So if you're doing 3D echo or CT, MRI, use those landmarks. If you can see the atrial septum, you're in the non-coronary cusp. If you can see the left atrial appendage, then you're in the left. So what we get, I've been charged to talk about TAVI and the decision-making process. And so in the old days, when we first started, this was the only decision that you had to make. How big is the aortic annulus in single dimension with a single caliper? Uh, in lieu of the spacer uh, sizer device that they put in during heart surgery. But we've come a long way from there, and we've come a long way because of the sophisticated imaging. When you think about your imaging, you always have to think about where you're imaging from. For example, in all of transthoracic echo, you're looking from below. And so if you look at this picture here, this very typical parasternal short axis, which you're all used to looking at, this is looking from below. You're standing at the feet or at the apex and you're looking up. Think about your landmarks. There's the atrial septum. So by definition, this is the non-coronary cusp. The most anterior one is always the right coronary cusp, and there's the left atrial appendage, so therefore that is the left coronary cusp. Lateral, medial, anterior, posterior. Now in transesophageal, we tend to look from above, and so the same sort of rules count. So there is the atrial septum, therefore non-coronary cusp. Most anterior is therefore right. The left atrial appendage is just here, so therefore that's the left coronary cusp. <coughs> With 3D scanning we mostly look from above, and this is going to be the, what we're going to use for our landmarks for the rest of this talk. And you remember this diagram which came from Aubrey Almeida, who's here today. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, anatomical associates of the aortic valve. And we'll work through it very quickly, we've uh, talked about this uh, picture before. But again, the atrial septum near to the non left, right, non, and the left coronary cusp near to the left atrial appendage. The aorticomitral curtain is attached to the posterior portion of the aortic root. So let's move forward and let's have a look at what's near everything. So the right coronary cusp is near the right ventricular outflow tract. In fact, it's wrapped by the right ventricular outflow tract. It goes from right atrium all the way round uh, via, uh, and, and formed with the ventricular septum round through the right ventricular outflow tract to the pulmonary valve. So that if you can see uh, RVOT, then you're in the right coronary cusp, right round to pulmonary valve. Now the non-coronary cusp, as we said, is associated with the atrial septum, but it's also associated with the medial end of the mitral valve and the trigone, the AV node is there, the aorticomitral curtain. Let's have a look now how this translates to transthoracic echo. So this is a, this is a picture of, the, of, the, of X plane looking at the parasternal long axis with a uh, right, left ventricular outflow tract view uh, from below on the right hand side. The left ventricular outflow tract is made up, as you can see, of muscular ventricular septum and the aorticomitral curtain, the anterior leaf of the mitral valve. It is not a standalone structure in its own right. You can see here that they're, they're, it, it, with, with just a little bit of tilting, you can bring in muscular septum, membranous septum, and the aorticomitral curtain. <coughs> right coronary artery is, uh, is anteriorly. <coughs> uh, left main is to the, to the posterior and to the left. Now, we're taught that when you do a parasternal long axis, you've got the left and not, sorry, the right and non-coronary cusp, and that is mostly true, but you can see that it wouldn't take much of a tilt to bring in the left coronary cusp. Generally, right and non. Tilting out to more lateral, and you, and, uh, sorry, towards more medial, and you're bringing in a little bit of tricuspid there. When you see tricuspid, you know you're more towards the medial and then you can see membrane septum there. And you can understand how a VSD might uh, impact upon uh, that uh, cusp there. The, four, the five chamber view is actually a cut through the right coronary and left coronary cusp, LCC and RCC, with the muscular septum there visible. 
Now, what are the decisions that ECHO has to make? Well, firstly, when you're thinking about TAVI, is this severe aortic stenosis? And we know the cath lab, peak to peak, mean gradient, and, uh, and uh, peak instantaneous gradient, and so on, and how they correlate with the ECHO. ECHO, luckily, is based on Doppler, and Doppler uh, is easy to assess, and in fact, continuous wave Doppler of aortic is probably the most trustable thing in all of echocardiography. 4V squared, if you get the, if you get the number right, uh, if you get the, uh, the interrogation right, it's very little room for error. Generally, it will only ever underestimate, because if you're off the beam slightly, it will be an underestimation. Anyway, normal folk have a, a velocity between 1 and 2.5 metres per second, 4V squared of that puts a peak gradient of 4 to 25 millimetres of mercury, and calculated normal people have between 1.5 and, and 3 square centimetres. I think we're all very aware of that. The mild to moderate range, 2.6 metres per second to 4 metres per second, 26 to 64 millimetres of mercury. Valve area is above 1 and below 1.5 square centimetres. But it's the severe stenosis that ends up in TAVI. Vmax more than 4, it used to be more than 5, but now more than 4 is the international criteria peak gradient more than 64, and a valve area less than 0.1. Now, it's all good when it's all good, but what happens when it's, when it's not concordant? So it's easy when the Vmax is high, big gradient, uh, and a valve area which is small. But what about when you've got other situations? For example, there are plenty of times when you see a valve that looks like that, but the Vmax is not above 4 metres per second, the mean gradient is not above 40, but the valve area appears to be below 1. Sometimes that really is true, and it's true because you've got poor cardiac output. Remember, stroke volume is proportional, sorry, gradient is proportional to stroke volume. And so you can have severe AS, truly severe AS, with a sick old heart that cannot, uh, that's not generating enough pressure because not generating enough cardiac output. So this really is severe AS. But there are some folks who look like they've got severe, severe AS, but when you, when you beef up ventricular function with dobutamine, the valve blows open. So sure, it's a stiff valve, but it's just not having enough uh, head of pressure behind it to open it. And this would be called pseudo-severe. And there's nothing worse than getting a call from an operating room when a surgeon says, I can put my elbow through this valve, it's so open. Uh, <laughs> and yet it looked like it was severe. So this is the place for dibutamine. Lastly, there is a place, there is a condition where you appear to have normal ventricular function, but it's such a small, such a hypertrophy, tiny cavity heart it's generating very few millilitres of output. And so this would be what we call paradoxical low flow, low gradient. Second decision, is it a tri-leaflet valve? Because all of the TAVI devices at the moment are set for tri-leaflet, and you saw this picture just before, so I'll move forward. But at the end of the day, what we care about is that it has an annulus that we can fit a TAVI into. And most of the decision process uh, as you're going into TAVI, once you've decided you're going that way, because it is severe aortic stenosis, is about getting the annulus right so that these devices, and remember there's two sorts fundamentally, there are the balloon expandable valves and the self-expanding valves. These are spring-loaded, these require a balloon to blow them up. Basically, you want to make sure that that uh, piece of prosthetic material is going to uh, uh, oppose all around the circumference so that there's no leak, because paravalvar leak is a very bad thing. And so it's important to get axial and try and get to, at right angles, either with CT or with echo, and this is an echo talk, there'll be CT in a minute, <coughs> to get axial, as we practised in the workshop, in every plane. Axially in the blue plane, axially in the green plane, and this multiplanar reconstruction, so that the red plane is a true cross-sectional area. <coughs> then, planimeter. And you pl planimeter to the, to the black-white interface. And in fact, done carefully, uh, we can get very close to the CT results with this uh, planimetered echo. And we do this basically on all cases. Uh, Siemens and some of the other vendors, but Siemens particularly, now have tissue tracking uh, using computerised uh, edge detection uh, modules. And these uh, can generate a cartoonised version of the exact outline of the aortic root and the mitral and give us exact dimensions uh, like we just did manually, but all done by artificial intelligence uh, speckle tracking. Finally, don't forget that the echo can be used to measure the size of the balloon because at the end of the day, if you're really stuck and you're struggling with non-concordance of data, the size of the balloon is the size. And so don't, don't forget about that. Some of the TAVI devices uh, just sit in the annulus, but the self-expanding the, the self, uh, valves uh, ascent, go into the ascending aorta. So measuring all of these dimensions are important. And this is an important part of the decision process when we're trying to choose between uh, the uh, self-expanding val valves 
and the uh, balloon valves. And the other thing that we can help decide is where we, there are these serious proximal septal hypertrophy type bulges because this, but this sort of a bulge will tend to want to spit out the tabby uh, when you're blowing it up. And so that's an important part of the decision process. After the valve's in, what can we do? So in the room or the next morning, you can take pictures and look for leaks and, look, but, and, and importantly look for gradients, look for the height. And, and in terms of the decision process, sometimes if there, if there are bad issues going on here, like it's too high, too low or leaking, in the room it might uh, prompt us to actually decide to put a second valve in valve. Regurgitation is, is, a, is a key problem. Regurgitation is bad. It's bad because it seems to be associated with increased mortality in the partner trials. And quite interestingly, even if you have mild regurgitation, paravalvo regurgitation, it's a bad thing, which is hard to fathom because people walk around with mild aortic regurgitation in their own valve, no problems at all. Yet if you've got mild paravalvo regurgitation, it seems to be a bad thing. When you see these regurgitations, it can either be through the valve, and that's typically when you've still got the wire in, or if the valve hasn't fully blown up and the leaflets are sort of falling in. But the bigger concern is the paravalvar leaks. The assessment of paravalvar leaks is tricky because the jets tend to be pretty flat, eccentric, and often don't really look that bad. But when you look cross-sectionally on them, on face, you can see oftentimes multiple jets of these leaks. You have to scan carefully because jets can hide behind the metal. And the way we quantitate this is using the VARC criteria where we measure what proportion of the circumference has got the leak. And so you measure, if you like, even with a planimeter, how much of the total circumference is being taken up. And typically more than 20 or now they say probably more than 30% of the circumference uh, having a leak uh, is consistent with severe and here are some guidelines for that. Don't forget the good old-fashioned things though, aortic arch reversal is a key marker of significant regurgitation and it's just as relevant in TAVI as it is in a, uh, a native valve. Finally, I'd like to make this uh, uh, advertisement. Uh, this is uh, Philippe Pibero, our friend uh, from uh, Canada, who basically is the world's master. And I uh, just uh, commend to you that he's coming to Echo Australia this year and his lectures are exquisite. So this is the man to listen to if you want to um, learn about complications. But just in terms of a last couple, migration is an issue. And so follow, following up late with uh, the, the um, uh, echo, we look to see that the device is still sitting at the same height. Here is one that appeared quite nicely uh, seated on the day, but one year later, the, vowel, the tabby is fully into the heart now. And it's been hammered down uh, by leaflet tissue over a 12 month period. We also look for axiality and for uh, general sort of adequacy of deployment. So to summarise, what do we decide, help decide with the echo? Well, we certainly help decide whether or not severe aortic stenosis. We then contribute to the sizing. We, if we're involved in the actual procedure, we help with the uh, axial deployment of the device. We look, most importantly, for regurgitation, complications and long-term monitoring. Thanks very much.